Fairbanks Jr. in The Silent Men. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men. Transcribed stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. This is no pleasant tale I have to tell. It is the story of the bitter struggle of the United States government to prevent the Soviet Union from arming for total war at American expense. It's a story of hate, intrigue, and murder told to me by a highly placed American official in Europe. In it, I will play the role of Special Agent Henry McAdam, a file case entitled Murder in Vienna, in which only the names and places are fictional. I just finished an assignment for the ECA in Florence, Italy, when a terse cable from Washington ordered me to report immediately to Special Agent Maury Kahn in Vienna. I'd worked with Maury some years ago on some tough narcotics cases, and a warm friendship had sprung up between us. It was good to see him weaving his lanky form through the little knots of pizza. Macadam! Washington's gift to law and order. <laughs> Come on. Well, where are we going? You know, in Vienna, there's only one thing you do on Sunday afternoon. Go for a walk. Any place in particular? No. Just so long as it's in the American zone of occupation. No. The others aren't so healthy, eh? Not for me. Vienna's divided into zones, just like Berlin. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, but what, what about the international patrol? Only in newsreels they're effective. Uh uh. What's the matter? Just picked up my shadow. Well, they don't let you get lonely, do they? No. For every American here, there's two commies to watch him. Let's stand here. He can't get close enough to hear me. You fill me in. What are you working on now? I don't want to talk shop today. It's Sunday, and the first nice day we've had in a month. Oh, it's lovely. So I'll take 60 seconds off to brief you on what I've been doing. After that, nothing. Till tomorrow. Deal? Sure. Okay. Vienna's Russia's most important commercial contact with the West. Uh Uh-huh. They do most of their buying here. They set up an agency under Colonel Zarkov. Ball bearings, machine tools, heavy precision machinery. They buy it from all over the world, including America. How do they clear the borders with it? They not only buy materials, they buy men. Customs inspectors, officials of all sorts. Mm. Kind of frightening, isn't it? Yeah, and sickening. Some big American firms are shipping these goods to neutral countries knowing they'll end up in Moscow. Well, we not only have to buck the commies, but Americans too, it seems. That's what I've been working on. Uh, You've made no reports on this, eh? Nope. I've been carrying the facts up here in my head. Lists of names, shipments, and proof. How come you haven't filed interim reports? (laughs) Interim reports would have attracted attention to what I was doing, and a lot of big names are mixed up in this. American names. They'd start throwing their weight around, and I'd be taken off the case one way or another. Like last night. What was last night? Last night, somebody took a shot at me. Where are we now? Neubergasse, where the American and French zones meet. Oh. You know, there's still a lot of charm about Vienna. Look at look at this statue of Mozart playing for two children dancing. And that organ grinder. <laughs> Vienna, city of music and romance. Not now. It's a city that lives in the past. A city of tired, faded dreams. In 24 hours, the charm wears off. And you see it for what it is. All right, but the 24 hours it takes, do you mind if I enjoy them? Say, you're right. You should enjoy them. And I'll tell you what I'll do, Henry. I'm going to help you. That's more like it. Come on. If there's one thing in Vienna that's a sheer delight, I have it. What's that? A girl oh. waiting for us at the Stadt Cafe. Whatever charm and gaiety was still left in Vienna seemed to have concentrated on the Stadtkaffee. 
It was a little sidewalk restaurant overflowing with coffee, conversation, and laughter. Molly's girl wasn't there when we arrived, and an overfed waiter thumped some coffee and a huge platter of pastries on the table before us. She's ten minutes late. That's not like us. <laughs> That's love for you. When ten minutes seems like an eternity. Yeah. <laughs> your shadow seems to be having himself a time. He's got himself a friend now. The new one's probably your boy. So soon? Yeah. Henry. I know. Carry a gun and watch out. They must know I'm onto something. They wouldn't have taken a shot at me. Where did it happen? I'd taken Elsa home. was on my way back. How long have you known her? Since I came here about a year ago. She's a receptionist at the ECA office here. Look, don't say anything to her about last night. Okay. Know anything about your work? No. Oh, there she comes now. And then some. Yeah. Elsa! <laughs> over here! Hello? Having your coffee without me? <laughs> Elsa, this is Henry McAdam, the friend I told you about. Oh, how do you do, Mr. McAdam? Oh, Henry, two beautiful women. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Henry. Some coffee? Please. Hey, why were you so late, Elsa? I had things to do. What kind of things? Oh, that is so like a man. For weeks now, he has been hiding some terrible secrets. And every time I ask him about it, he tells me politely to mind my own business. <laughs> now I am ten minutes late, and I must give him a detailed account. Uh, Perhaps he will tell you what this mysterious business of his is all about, Henry. Could be. And you will tell me? Sure, positively. <laughs> Just so that you may come with us. Elsa's making dinner for us tonight. No, really? You are coming to my apartment. Hey, you can't back out of this one, McAdam. You want to shatter a beautiful romance? Oh, two company Oh, come along, my two handsome American boys. One on each arm. <laughs> <laughs> On our way out, we passed the two Russians, Maury's shadow and his friend. They were keenly interested in our departure, but made no move to follow us. We walked a few blocks to a garage where Maury was having his jeep serviced. Then we drove down Neubergasse towards the outskirts of the city where Elsa lived. We still in the French sector? Just left it. We're in the Russian area now. I think I'll take it a little faster. Kind of a desolate stretch. Yeah. Behind us. So what? It's a free road. But well, they're moving up on us. Take a look, McAdam. I don't know. They're moving up awful fast. Hang on. I'm going to open our wide. They're gaining. Oh, it's just probably some guy who feels like racing. <laughs> Guess I'm getting jumpy after last night. You know. We'll know in a couple of seconds. They're even with us. Pull over. Keep going, Marty. Don't stop. Oh, they'll run us into the ditch. We'll be killed. Up your car. It's no use. I should have known better. We got to stop. Elza, when I stop, you get out and run for it. You too, McAdam. Get out, Elsa. I'm saying. No, it's me they want. You can get away, too, Henry. No. Hurry, Elsa. It's too late. Get out of the car. Hurry up. What do you want? Get out. Let the girl go. Elsa, you go. She stays. She's got nothing to do with this. I'm not asking you. Start walking toward my car. Keep your hands over your heads. Uh, this is good night's work. Murray Cannon, Henry McAdams, two American agents. Should get you an extra issue of vodka. Hey, look, uh, I've got nearly a hundred American dollars in my pocket. Take it and let the girl go, huh? For an American, you are very chivalrous. Peter, huh? these men must have guns. Take them. Now, uh, And now, get in the car. We will be a little crowded, but not for long. You can get in the back seat with your girl. But do Stefan. You keep them company. McAdam, you get in the front with Peter and me. <laughs> hey, uh, what do you want her for? She knows nothing. She's done nothing. You are making me sick about the girl. Shut up. We demand that you let her go. You demand? Ah, oh, that's different. Peter, open the door and let her out. Stop the car. That wasn't in the bargain. Throw her out, Peter. All right? No! Elsa! Why, you... Stop it, you fool. You will make me go up the road. Not for I... Peter, quiet, Peter. All right? Ah! antiseptic smell of the hospital that made me first realize I was still alive. I struggled to get my eyes open and finally made it. I found myself speaking to a man who sat on a chair near my bed. But the voice didn't sound like mine. Ah, uh, what do you want? Nice to have you with us again. How long have I been where I am? 
Been less than two days. Oh. Feeling pretty woozy? Tongue weighs two tons. How did Mari make out? You're in no shape to talk yet. I said, how did Mari make out? That's doctor's orders. Dead? The doctor said to... Mari's dead. You've got to tell me. Yes. Uh, and the girl? What girl? Elsa. She was with us in the car. We found you and Mari in a field. Oh. There was no girl. Look in the ditch. You, you'll find her, too. What do you want? I work with Mari. I'm Kilbride, his chief. Good for you. Go away. We'll get to the bottom of this as soon as you can talk. Sure, sure, we'll talk. Lots of talk. But Mari's dead. He never had a chance, did he? You go back to sleep now. All right, all right. But when I get up, I'm resigning. I'm going back home and raise cabbages. Twenty-four hours later, the miracle that's present in every one of us had taken place. I was out of bed, walking groggily around my little room. The door opened, and a nice-looking man in his early fifties came in. He looked vaguely familiar, but I, I couldn't place him. Well, hello, McAdam. You're looking much better today. Well, thanks. I'm Jack Kilbride, head of the division that Mari Khan worked for. Oh, I remember you now. You, you asked me about the girl. Yes. Yeah. You said look in the ditches. Maybe we'd find her. We looked. She wasn't there. Any ideas? Yeah. Well, let's have them. Tomorrow. Why tomorrow? Because I get out of here tomorrow. You want to take over where Maury left off? That's the general You're idea. Not strong? No. I'll gain strength as I go along. All right. Report into my office before you do anything. Sure thing. You'll have all the help we can spare you on this thing. Just one good man will do it. And I got him all picked out. Name him, and he's yours. Mari Khan. Can you get him for me? They checked me out of the hospital 10 o'clock the next morning. I phoned information at ECA headquarters. I asked for Elsa, and they said she hadn't reported in for work in three days. They gave me her address. 797 Schoenberg Platz, apartment 3. I took a cab to that address. I managed to climb the stairs and ring the bell on her apartment door. See ya. A middle-aged lady opened it and stared at me out of frightened eyes. What is? What is wrong? <sighs> you are sick? Uh, a glass of water and I'll be all right. Come in. Sit down. I <sighs> will bring you some. Here. Ah, thanks. What do you want? Elsa, where is she? She is not home. I've got to talk to her. I know nothing. You had better leave at once. When did you see her last? I have not seen her. Please, go. You live here with her? Yeah. I am her aunt. She said she was bringing her boyfriend home for dinner on Sunday night. Were they here? Yeah. You're lying. They did not come here for supper. Maury was killed on the way here. Why are you lying? They, they told me to say nothing. If I tell you, they will kill me. I was in the car when they threw her out. Is she still alive? Yeah. She is badly hurt. But she still lives. She's in a hospital? Yeah. Which one? That is all I can tell you. Already, I have told you too much. Her life is in danger. Tell me how to get to her and I can save her. I am helpless. We are all helpless. Now go. go. I found Elsa's hospital easy enough. By phoning and asking for a patient by the name of Elsa Wassel, I found out where she was. In a hospital called the Ladino, in the Russian sector, of course. The girl at the desk was friendly enough and told me that Elsa was in room 56 but couldn't see visitors. Doctor's orders. When she turned away to answer the phone, I slipped by her down the long corridor. The door to room 56 was blocked by a heavy-set man. He looked familiar. 
I'd seen him not too long ago behind the wheel of a car in which Murray, Elsa, and I had been taken for a car ride. What do you want? We meet again, eh? Again? We've never seen you before. No, not since last Sunday night. Last Sunday night? You must be crazy. I've been on duty every night for two weeks. Care to let me try to prove it? The young lady inside. You can't go in there. Doctor's orders. I'm going in anyways. Well, you are not. I put up a fight, but my knees gave way on me, and Ivan the Terrible finished up by tossing me out on the street like a drunken bum. I lay there on the grass trying to gather up enough strength to get up. Finally, two old women helped me to my feet and put me in a cab. I drove to my hotel and crawled into bed. There I stayed until the next morning. About 11 o'clock, I got down to Kilbride's office. Come in, McAdam. Sit down. Ah, thanks. I thought I'd see you yesterday. I uh, did a little sightseeing. At the Lavinov Hospital. Thought I'd get in to talk to Elsa. Just like we tried the day before. You couldn't get in either? No, no. Doctor's orders, no visitors. Did they say when? No. The man guarding her door was one of the men in the car Sunday night. Are you sure? Positive. Uh, you'll be alibied a hundred different ways. If we could get in to see the girl, she'll prove it. I wouldn't count too much on her. By the time we get to see her, she won't remember a thing. Give me an idea of what Murray was on and I'll take over. Well, we don't know too much about it. Well, let's see his file record. He left none. He kept it all in his head. You two were supposed to compile it. That's right. Well, there must be some clue as to what he was doing. Well, some little scraps of paper we found in his desk. He used to jot down notes like a lecture or something, leave them in his drawer. They don't mean anything to us. I hope you hung on to them. Oh, I got them right here in my desk. Well, let's take a look. Now, here's one that just has the word Barrington written on it. And here's another one that says S.D. May I see them, please? Yeah. Now, here's, uh, here's one with another name, Zarkov. That's the only one that means anything to me. Colonel Zarkov, he's in charge of the Russian buying commission here. Good. I'll take these with me. All right, I've made copies. What are you going to do with them? Study them until I can get the message they're supposed to give. I took Maury's notes to my hotel and spent a few hours trying to make sense out of them. Two of them had been written in pencil, blue pencil, and by the strength of the coloring, I knew they'd been written at the same time. These were the two that read Barrington on one of them and two letters S.D. on the other. I put a transoceanic phone call through to my chief in Washington. Adam, you all right now? Fair. You heard about Maury? Yes. What's on your mind? I've taken over for Maury. I want you to trace a name for me. Give it to me. Barrington. Two R's. Could be the name of someone in the export-import business. Ah, that isn't much to go on. What do you want to know in case we find him? Everything. Now, look, this might help you. The initials S for Sugar, D for David. Maybe the trade name of the company or the name of the company Barrington Ship Goods to. <laughs> you couldn't be bigger if you tried. <laughs> Barrington and S.D. You're looking for a miracle. Well, I went to the right spot for one, didn't I? morning, Kilbride sent an office card to get me. When I joined him, he was pacing his office floor with nervous excitement. You feeling better today? Physically, yes. Good enough to visit a sick friend? Elsa? Yeah, Provo Marshal's office phone. Colonel Zarkov has issued a special permit for us to visit Elsa Wassel at 11 o'clock. Zarkov, the big boy himself. Well, the Provo Marshal informed Zarkov of this officer's interest in the case, and he has graciously arranged this meeting so we can clear him of any connection with it. You know what that means? I can guess. It means it's all rigged up. That girl will remember a thing. It's a waste of time to go. Come on, Chief. I need the air. The girl at the information desk at the Levinov Hospital nodded us towards the long corridor and told us to go to room 56. I caught a glimpse of the same guard who had blocked me yesterday when I tried to see Elsa. Stop a minute. What is it? The guy at the door. He drove the car we were in. I'd know him anywhere. How come they left him here? I don't get it. You'll get it. 
Yes, American gentleman. Been on any more motor trips lately? That's the you're on. We have a permit to see Elsa Wasp. Oh, just a minute, please. Colonel Zarkov, the two Americans. Oh, yes. Mr. Kilbride. <laughs> we have met before. Your friend, I have not had the pleasure. Henry McAdams. How do you do? Improving, no thanks to you. Rather surprised to find you here, Colonel. Isn't this a little out of your line? Your provo marshal has told me the basis of your interest, Miss Girl. There are some very ugly implications which it is my duty to disprove. While you two diplomats are exchanging credentials, I'll go in and talk to the girl. We will all go. You understand, of course, she has been badly hurt and must not be too severely attacked. Elsa. Do you remember this man, Miss Watson? He... He was in the car with me. Do you remember my name, Elsa? No. You were a friend of the man who drove me home from the office. That's right. Do you remember everything that happened? Clearly. Good girl. Tell us. Yes. Tell us exactly what happened. I was being driven home from the office with this man and his friend... On the way, we were stopped by another car. So? How many men were in the car that stopped you? I do not remember. More than one, that is all I know. Hmm? Did you know any of them? Tell the truth. Yeah. Uh, one of them was Hans Dribble, an old sweetheart of mine. He was furious because I had told him I didn't want to see him anymore. Mm-hmm. And what nationality was he? Austrian, of course. Austrian? There wasn't an Austrian in the whole car. No, I'm mistaken. They were all Austrian. How many men did you say there were in the car? I do not remember. Can you give us any descriptions? No, only Hans. And I have already told this other gentleman... You that... may rest assured we are searching for him. If I show you one of the men in the car, would you remember him? Yes. Colonel, ask your man outside the door to come in, please. Certainly. Alex? Come inside, please. No, it's no use, Henry. They've rehearsed this a hundred times. This man, Elsa. Have you seen him before? He has been standing at my door. Before then? No. He was not one of the men in the car? No, he was not. Elsa! Look at me and say that. I had never seen him before I got into the hospital. You're lying, Elsa. Do you hear? You're lying. This man kills your lover. So now you're resorting to typical American police methods. I shall have to conclude this interview. Elsa, were you thrown out of the car? I wasn't thrown out. I jumped out myself. I was afraid of Hans, what he might do to me. <laughs> you see, gentlemen, a purely domestic affair, a jealous lover, the triangle. Uh, our patient is becoming weary. Let's go, Henry. One minute. Elsa, you know Mari is dead. I have been told. You won't help me punish the men who did it. You loved Maury, didn't you? I... I did not. One does not love Americans. One merely tolerates them for cigarettes and silk stockings. Is that not so, Elsa? Don't let them frighten you, Elsa. One last chance. Would you swear in a court that what you have told us is the truth? Yes. No, no, see what you have done. Let's get out of here. All the way back to Kilbride's office, I burned with anger and frustration. Kilbride tried to snap me out of it, but I practically told him to go find a lake and jump in it. He put up with me till he got back in his office. What you need is a new head. One you're wearing is useless for a while. Take a week off. You're wrong, Chief. After seeing Elsa, what I need is a new stomach. Oh, she was scared, Henry. Scared to death. The whole world's scared to death. Bluffed into a state of panic. I'm in a panic. You're in a panic. Oh, here's a cable on my desk for you. Oh, thanks. A week in Paris, maybe. Hey, be. hey, get what? a load of this. From the Chief in Washington. Check record. No Barrington registered in import-export trade. However, Barrington may refer to road and airstrip paving machines, highly strategic, and forbidden entry into Iron Curtain countries. Oh. Letters SD may have been abbreviation for Switzerland. Three of these shipped to Europa Company in Switzerland last month. 
Properly licensed, but investigate immediately. Signed, Bert. I'll get busy on that at once, and you take yourself a holiday. That'll be my holiday. A week in Switzerland? Oh, I feel better already. <laughs> A day later, we were in Bern, Switzerland, talking to the owner of the Europa Company, the address to which the airstrip papers had been consigned. It took the presence of a high Swiss official who accompanied us and the threat of arrest to force an admission from him that he had reshipped the machines to Budapest. We got the numbers of the freight cars which carried them and located them in a little town on the Austria-Hungarian border. From a reluctant customs official, we got permission to hold the train for examination. I guess they're right at the end. Scrap iron they're building, man. Sure. Gives the customs people an owl to inspect scrap iron. Here we are. Yeah. There's a friend of ours talking to the customs man. Colonel Zarkov. Let's go. Colonel Zarkov? Hmm? Oh, the <laughs> America. What do you want? Nothing much. Just to take a look at those last three cars. Henry, break the seal. You, you cannot do that. The shipment is consigned to my government. My government says it stays here. Uh, uh, take a look at it. A great big airstrip paper. Too bad, Zarkov. No, no, it is not that serious, I assure you. We have already received delivery on 20 of those magnificent American machines. And there will be more... Many more. Ah, Maury would have liked that. Stopping the shipment the way we did. Yeah. And there will be more, many more, Zarkov said. I don't believe him, do you? I don't know. I really don't know. How come you're so confident? Just a feeling that the American people are waking up. The people back home are starting to realize that all this corruption and greed can only lead to one thing, national suicide. Mm. Say, how'd that sentence look in my report? It could get you a promotion, a job in the Congressional Library. Oh, enough said. Strike it off the record. This is Douglas Fairbanks again. Stopping the transshipment of vital war materials behind the Iron Curtain closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Produced and directed by Warren Lewis. The file case, Murder in Vienna, was written by Lewis and Russoff and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in our cast were Larry Dobkin, Joan Banks, Lou Merrill, Jeff Corey, Elaine Welch, and Mr. Piler. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting cases involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men.